with that one, page number six. And uh, I want you to look at that very closely. And before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you for all that we have in him. We thank you for being blessed uh, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And we thank you for the ministry uh, that you've entrusted to us to preach your son. We thank you for it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Uh, one of the things that you look at on this, on, on, on lesson number two, that's page six, you see the grid there, it says uh, one, two, three across there, uh, that, that is a collection of verses that will help you to understand, 23, 24, and 25 of the third chapter of Romans, to help you understand what we're going to talk about today of the three critical issues. Now we've been through the, uh, the, uh, the introduction to the program uh, about knowing the Gospels. Th those sheets are here, by the way, also. I think they're on, on the table there. You can get one of those. We also went through, in lesson one, all the reasons for no excuses, over overcoming excuses. And the way I approached that was I did not approach it from the viewpoint of, of, of addressing all the various excuses that people have because there, there's too many of them. What I did is I went from the viewpoint of, look, this is what God says for you to do. Now, if you can come up with excuses against that list, good luck, okay? The word says this. That's on lesson two, or lesson one, excuse me, week two. And then the, the three critical issues, we might probably go into this next week. I don't know. We, we might have to because this is a really an eight-week course that should take about 24 weeks to do that we're going to do in six weeks. So we're trying to slimline this a little bit so that uh, it doesn't drag itself out. Evangelism should not be something that takes a long time to learn, but it will take a lifetime to master. So you've got to get the basic issues down and find out what it is you're going to say to people. Grid number one, notice what it says. It says, uh, all have sinned. Now, everybody knows that verse. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, everybody can quote that verse, it seems like. All have sinned. But when you say that to somebody, you are establishing the need. And then you demonstrate what sin is. And you have to ask yourself, what is the answer to that question? Okay? The question is, what sin is? What is it? The statement here is, what is it? How do you identify it? And some will say, well, sin is a transgression of the law. Okay? What else is it? Uh, I mean, it, there, there are lots of different ways for people to identify sin. What's the problem we face today? The problem we face today is what? People don't believe there is such a thing as sin. They don't even think there is a right and wrong. They don't know the difference between right and wrong. The Bible talks about that, that every man might do right, that which is right in his own eyes. That's not a good scenario. When you, when you talk like that, what you're saying is you just go do what you want. And God, when, he, when you read that verse in, in the Bible, that's what he's saying. This is not a good thing. That's unrestrained, okay? And uh, in this world system that we live in right now, we are rapidly moving towards a more lawless type society with less, with more laws, <laughs> but, but less understanding of God's laws and what he wants us to do. So we're going out into a hostile environment when we go teach the gospel. All right, that's the way it is. And it's always been that way. It, it's never changed. If you go to page 9 real quick, you can see uh, point A and point B. And under point A, you can see under number 1, under point A, all people are sinners. You see that? It says what sin is, Romans 3.23. So you get over to page 9, it's going to teach you what to put in that on those blanks there. Okay, here's what. Sin is every action, attitude, thought, and word that violates God's holy standard of righteousness. And it will include lying, stealing, swearing, taking God's name in vain, etc. And you, you look at that, you see the standard of righteousness, the standard of righteousness in the word of God is the law of Moses. The law is holy, righteous, just, and good. There's nothing wrong with the law of Moses. The only thing that's wrong is that you can't keep it. The problem isn't with the law. The problem was, is with man. What did Israel say when God presented them the law? They said, all that thou hast said, we will do. And when you think about that, what they were saying was, we can be as righteous as you. No problem. 
they agreed to do something that they could never possibly hope to do. And when you deal with people on the law and you talk about things like the Ten Commandments with people, you talk about, they'll talk about the Sermon on the Mount, they'll talk about all these various things in which they have no idea how to fulfill those things. The Golden Rule, for instance. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. No man on this earth has ever fulfilled that verse except the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and it won't happen until he comes back and he creates a way for that to happen in the lives of his people. I will say this, he's already done that. And it's available to you and I. Uh, turn over to Romans 8 and I'll share something with you that I think you'll enjoy. Look at Romans chapter 8. When you, when you work against the law and the law works against you, you realize that the law has some basic things about it that you need to learn. And this is going to come up in your conversations when you talk to people about sin and these three critical issues. The problem is, what? It's sin, death, and judgment. That's the problem. Now, this other sheet that I gave you, um, I don't know. Here it is right here. Uh, if you don't have one of these, I don't know if we got any more of those. Um, we might be out of these, too. Uh, this one we have on the table all the time. This gives you, uh, it's entitled on the top, How to Know for Sure You Have Eternal Life. This has the, the, the three critical issues outlined. We use the three critical issues here all the time because it works. And you find out that man's problem is sin. It's eventually going to be death because that's what sin brings forth when it's finished is death. And it's going to bring judgment. Now on this paper, if you'll notice, this is an older sheet. I put the word hell there. And for many years I had the word hell. But I realized that under man's problem, when you talk about hell, you're only talking about one portion of the problem. Judgment is more than just one thing. In other words, it's not just hell. Hell is the least of your worries when you die lost. Because hell is just a, a, a containment period, a containment place that is going to be where unbelievers go before hell itself, along with them, are cast into the lake of fire at the great white throne, Revelation 20. So we, we don't get a full picture of judgment. Another thing about this is death itself in the Bible is a judgment. That's why people die. It's a judgment. And uh, he said to Adam, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, Adam didn't die at that particular time. That was the day he ate. That was the particular time and place. But 800 and some odd years into his life, he expired. I have a chart at home I think you'd all like to look at about the antediluvians and, and about all the people. And it gives the, a line on the chart uh, from how long each person lived, when they were born and how long they lived. And when you put a line from their life and you put them all together all the way down to, to the flood, it's amazing that when Noah was young, Adam was still alive. You don't think about that. That's amazing. In 969 years old, Methuselah is still living. 969 years old. And he dies the day of the flood. So longevity was great back in, in the antediluvian period, but today it's not, it's not as great, is it? And what you find out now is that when you die, there's a reason. Look over at Romans chapter 5. It is appointed unto man once to die. After that, the judgment. But Paul gives us a great explanation in Romans 5, 12. He says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. That happened through Adam. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now he says in verse 13, there's a parenthesis that goes, that starts there in verse 13, and it goes, it goes quite a ways, okay? There's a long explanation uh, in that parenthesis, okay? It goes all the way over to the end of verse 17. And when you read this, he's going to explain something to you that starts out in verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Was God destroying people or dealing with judgment on people or, or anything like that directly the way he was under the law before the law was given? No. There were sporadic, individual, case-by-case -case situations. The flood was one of them. 
So was the destruction of Egypt uh, and Pharaoh. But up until the law, there's a 2,500 year period from Adam to Moses, and that period is a very, very long space of time in our history. It's only 1,500 years from Moses to Christ. So you've got this 2,500 year period from Adam to Moses where there is no law. And notice what Paul says here. He says, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. You say, whoopee, that's great. He's not reaching down and just banging on you for sin. He's not going to judge you just for acting out your sin. The world was very sinful at that time. As a matter of fact, after the first thousand years, it got so sinful that he had to destroy the entire thing. Notice verse 14, nevertheless, regardless of that, he says, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. They didn't sin the same way Adam sinned, but they still died. Why was that? Because all the world, the entire human race was in Adam when Adam sinned, and he passed it on to everyone, and people died. And you read it in the Old Testament, he, he he lived so long, and he begat so-and-so, and he died, and he died, and he died. You just, pages of it. And you see that in the, in the genealogy back there, and you say, okay, so there, there's a transgression going on against God's rules and laws and his righteousness, but there's a period back here for 2,500 years that's very, very like what we live in here today in the dispensation of grace. We've been going now for, since the the Apostle Paul got saved, and since the message of grace has been made known, we're about 1950 some odd years, or 40 years, into this thing, or maybe 1970 years, I have to figure it out, but the, you know, the, the whole thing with Paul begins before AD 40, and, and that whole period from Paul all the way to where we are now, notice I say over here <laughs> on the end, uh, we don't know how big the dispensation of grace is as far as length and how long it's going to last, but we know this. It's a very long period, and it's been almost 20 centuries, and it's the same way back here. It's fascinating how that when you look at the dispensation of the grace of God, it would make sense that that period would be long because God's long-suffering, isn't he? And he's doing something today. He's doing something specific. And that specific thing that he's doing today in the dispensation of grace is not setting up the kingdom of heaven as was planned. That was postponed. But now he's forming a new group of people, a new part of his family, in which now he's going to bring forth a little bit of information to us about his eternal purpose in Christ and that this whole thing with Israel that has to do with the earth and setting up a kingdom on the earth is only half the plan. The other half is what he's going to do in the heavenly places and that's what he's going to do with us, the body of Christ. That's why when we're done being faithful ambassadors preaching this message to the world, we're taken out into the heavenly places and we replace those principalities, powers, and dominions out there that are going to be cast into the earth. So there are some people out there that have your jobs right now that are going to be gone. They're not really people, they're creatures. And those creatures are going to be replaced by you and I. And when that happens, at that particular time, there's going to be a major shift and a major change in the heavenly places. And what's going to happen? It's going to be, it's going to be free from satanic opposition. All of that will then be contained in the earth itself when, when Satan and his angels are cast into the earth in the middle of the tri uh, 70th week of Daniel. This is three and a half years into the, great tribu into the tribulation, the beginning of the great tribulation, and that all happens sometime after we're gone. Now, we don't know how long this period is from the time we go up until this takes place, but there is some setup time. You notice there's a gap there, and there's some setup time before all this happens, but once it happens... The heavens are free from satanic invasion and, and rebellion and all that, and it's all going to be gone. We're going to be installed as God planned. God's plan to do all this, when he adds this plan to the program, this is the program without us in it right there. There's the entire program for Israel right there. The problem is we're not on that plan. We're not in that plan. Now, God has a plan that goes all the way back before the foundation of the world. 
Everything concerning the kingdom comes from the foundation of the world. It's promised from the foundation of the world. But we find out when we start reading the revelation given to Paul that what's going on with us today was actually formulated and planned before the foundation of the world. Now, turn to Titus chapter 1. I'm going to shed some light on this message that you have because this message that you have creates in you some things that no other group of people have ever had, ever. You're a new species of humanity. Uh, turn over to uh, Titus chapter 1, please. Titus chapter 1. You're a completely new species. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You're a brand new creature. And this new creature has a new life, a new purpose. You're now considered an ambassador with a particular job. Our job is to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Now, God's program with Israel is based on prophecy. This book that we read and study out of is the only book in the world that is, is based on the idea of predictive prophecy. It's true, and it's accurate, and God says that it's absolutely, completely without error. Now, here it is right here, our program again, but it's not based on prophecy. It's based on an idea of a mystery. A mystery is the opposite of this. This is something that's foretold, and it's told forth by the prophets as they preach it. But now the mystery is something that God held back. He hid. It says it's hid in him. It's hid in God. Now, this sheds a little light on Titus 1 because notice what Paul says. In verse 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Now how are you going to go into a book of prophecy that starts in the book of Genesis where the beginning of the world begins in its recording and try to come up with information that has to do with something that happened before the world began? How do you know what happened before the world began? It's all taught to you very plainly in Romans to Philemon. It's a mystery, but not anymore, okay? Turn over, to, uh, turn over to 1 Corinthians with me real quick, and you can see that this was all done with the idea of keeping it secret from someone, a particular individual. Uh, notice what he says. Verse 4, but my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, for, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 4, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit, notice what he says now. He says, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, mature, people that can understand this, he says. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but notice what verse 7 says. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. There it is. He says, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, if they would not have participated in the crucifixion, what would have happened? That would have put a snag in the program, wouldn't it? So what God does is he keeps everything a secret. The battle between Satan and God is not about power. Satan's not that dumb. It's about intelligence. It's about who's the smartest. And Satan, you begin to realize just exactly what he was so swelled up about. And what happens is when God, when God pronounces these things upon him, he says five times, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. He says all those I wills, and God responds with the same thing, five I wills. So between Ezekiel and Isaiah, you have one talking about, this is what I'm going to do, and God says, this is what I'm going to do. And God has no inkling, or, or Satan has no inkling about what God has in plan for him. 
All he's doing is watching the program of prophecy, and he's very busy trying to stop the seed from coming. He's, trying, he's very busy trying to, to create uh, havoc in the nation of Israel, like getting them to go under idolatry and all those things that he tries to do. And he works all the way up to the night before the crucifixion, and he enters into Judas, and he carries out the thing that he thinks is going to win his program. The Lord says to him, what thou do, go do us quickly. And he did. But he didn't realize, and this is where it's so interesting because the passive view or the passive approach from God's viewpoint is he doesn't have to do anything to squish him. He just withholds information from him and he hangs himself, which is usually the way most people that you're giving you trouble will hang themselves too if you give them enough rope. And what happens is, he comes along here and he participates in his own demise. Now, get a picture of this over in 2 Corinthians or uh, in Colossians 2. Get the picture of this because this is beautiful. I love reading this. This is great. Look at verse 13. He says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, that's your condition is being lost, and you're, and you're being unassociated with Israel and the religion of Judaism. You had no part in all of that. You were a Gentile. He says, Hath he quickened together with him, the Lord Jesus Christ, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now look at verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, that's the satanic principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, the whole universe knows what's happened. Satan's descent, as Christ said, I saw Satan fall like heaven, like, uh, from heaven like lightning. His descent was down, and, and then it's going to be, when he gets kicked out of there over here, he gets kicked out of heaven, it's going to be down here into the earth, and then when he gets kicked, when he gets at the second coming, he gets, gets kicked down into the pit, and then he waits there for a thousand years. He's let out a while, and then he's burned up. He's cast in a lake of fire forever. Now this whole plan, this whole program is running along pretty smoothly until this happens. Because what is happening here is not just from the foundation of the world. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. It's from before the foundation of the world. There's a plan to do this in redemption long before the scriptures are ever even written. Turn to Genesis chapter 3 and you can see what is commonly called the proto-evangel. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is a pronouncement of judgment against the satanic element in the world at that time, Satan himself and all that followed him. And if you look at Genesis 3, 15, you have the first promise in your Bible of a coming Redeemer to take care of the problem of sin. Look at verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between the, uh, thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Where does his heel get bruised? It gets bruised, Christ's heel gets bruised at Calvary. But what happens over here when he comes back? He crunches his head, doesn't he? That's what you do to a snake. You crunch him in the head, okay? And this whole thing that's going to happen is now unfolding with us in the dispensation of grace because God has now revealed the mystery to Paul. As a matter of fact, what goes along with this whole plan of forming the body of Christ and what we're going to do in the heavenly places also comes along the preaching of the cross so that everybody, even the people in this program, Peter, James, and John, they all figured it out by learning it from Paul. They could not figure out where this fit in. They looked at this as such a great tragedy. Paul says, no, this is not a tragedy. This is the key to the whole program. Look over at Ephesians chapter 3. Now, to, to learn more about the mystery, you go to Ephesians chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and those six chapters will give you the doctrinal viewpoint and the treatise of what the mystery is all about. And it will follow up with books that, that are working with the book of Ephesians, which is Philippians and Colossians. All three of these books are prison epistles, and they're about the church, the body of Christ. The church, the body of Christ, has the mission of evangelism today. That's its mission. 
Its mission is that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So what's the number one thing you do when you go out and evangelize? You get people saved. After that, what do you do? You bring them to the knowledge of the truth here. Why? So that they don't think they're over here in this program. What happens when you try to operate over here in this program? You handle snakes and die. You sell all your property and go broke. Somebody promises you a healing and you go to the funeral home. It doesn't work. This program over here will not work over here. Never has and never will. Your program is such that you're in a program now that God has specifically designed with a specific purpose and it's not building the kingdom of heaven on the earth. It's about translating you into the kingdom of his dear son called the body of Christ. Colossians 1, that's the kingdom of his dear son. So what do you have? In the body of Christ, you have a particular mission. Here's the kingdom of God. You have the body of Christ over here, and you've got the kingdom of heaven over here. You've got two separate sub-kingdoms within the overall kingdom of God. So whenever you see the phrase kingdom of God, he's talking about the overall kingdom here. When he uses the term kingdom of heaven, which Paul never uses once, by the way, when you see that term kingdom of heaven, it's talking about the Davidic kingdom promised to King David back here under the Davidic covenant, right there. And that kingdom is a specific kingdom on this earth, and it's going to happen. It is not happening today, although millions of people are trying to teach us that, that it's either already passed, there is no such thing, or we're in it right now. None of which are true, okay? You're not in the kingdom of heaven. You're in the body of Christ. And the sooner you learn that, the sooner you understand your mission. Your mission is to preach Christ crucified, not that Jesus Christ is coming back. Now, you believe that he's going to come back, don't you? I believe he's coming back for me to get me and take me out, and I believe he's coming back to set up the kingdom. We call that being premillennial. But we're not looking for that. We're looking for this one over here. And the issue is not that it's going to come to us. We're going to go to it. In other words, our kingdom is to go up and rule and reign. Whereas they're waiting for the kingdom of heaven to come and sit down on the earth and establish his reign on the earth. That's when he takes the thing that Satan usurped from Adam and he takes it. You remember when Satan offered him the kingdoms of this world in a moment of time? There was no argument about who they belonged to. Everything that Satan tried to get Jesus Christ to do in the temptation were all things that will happen to him. But Satan was trying to get him to do them out of order, dispensationally at the wrong time, like right now. Well, it wasn't time for him to do those things. You know why? Because he hadn't gone to Calvary yet. He had to go here because he was born to die. This is the key to the whole thing. The whole universe, as we know it, in time and space that we're a part of, it all begins right here. Everything looks forward to this. And everything here looks back to it. That's the central thing. My brother says, don't worry about tomorrow because God's already there. Well, he was already at Calvary and already went through it back here when they designed it and planned it to execute it. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all three involved, as they are with everything. And that plan was to create a way by which mankind could get back to God in a just and righteous way. As a matter of fact, it's not just a way, it was the only way. There is no other way for it to happen. Otherwise, God would have done it without giving his son. But that never happened because this was the only possible way it could happen. Turn to Ephesians 3. The apostles learned about this because they were troubled. They didn't understand. And they didn't quite get it. And Paul explained it to them. And then they got it. And they agreed to it. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 1. He says, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given, uh, excuse me, uh, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, uh, whereby when you read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Those are concerning the other books that have been circulating that Paul had already written. Look at verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, 
as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets how? How did the holy apostles and prophets learn it? They learned it by the Spirit. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. Here's the, verse 6 is the key. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by what? The gospel. So the gospel comes to us by the promise given to Abraham. All people on the earth from Adam to the end of time all get saved by a promise that God made to Abraham for eternal life. The promise of the Spirit is eternal life. Now, the nation of Israel did not get this, and they mistook what was given with Moses for this right here. This is the first contract. This is the second contract. The promise is first. The law lays on top of that as an addendum, and it says, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put the law on there for this reason, to restrain evil. Otherwise, if you didn't restrain evil and, and have a way for this nation to survive, there wouldn't have been a nation Israel to come and set the kingdom up with. Because mankind always self-destructs. The flood proves it, and it's proven all the way down through history. Unless God intervenes, it always self-destructs. So the restraining is necessary, and he puts it in there for that purpose. Now, it's also the number one reason it's actually given is to expose sin. It is to reveal sin. Paul says in Romans 3 that it's by the knowledge of sin. Okay, That's what the law is. It's, it's by the law we have the knowledge of sin. It's not the forgiveness of sin. It's not the payment for sin. It's not the giving of life in any way. It's not the means of justification. It is for one reason. You're condemned, and you better live by the law. It's a do-or-die program. It's not a, I think I'll do it if I feel like it. It's a do-or-die program. And it's a contract with Israel that they could never keep, and they never did keep it. And for 1,500 years, the jury was out. Are they going to keep it? Are they not going to keep it? And it was proven here, the, the, the most religious people that ever lived on this earth put Jesus Christ, their own God, on the cross. That's what religion does. They did not recognize their own Savior. Now, go over to Romans 8. And you say, well, what hope is there for us? Quite a bit. Look at Romans chapter 8. You're never going to keep the law. But I can tell you this, there's something that can happen to you if you believe on Jesus Christ. Not only get saved from hell, that's a side benefit, but now you can actually walk according to the doctrine that Paul gives us, and he says it's a doctrine which is according to godliness. It's true godliness. How does true godliness occur in the life of a believer today? It's by the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Look at Romans chapter 8. He says, there is therefore, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, this condemnation here is not hell. It's not talking about you going to hell. He's not saying there's no condemnation for those who are saved. He's saying there's no self-condemnation. There's no condemnation by being under a performance-based system. What happens when you do wrong? You feel guilty? Yeah. You feel bad about it. You have a conscience. And that conscience is accelerated and expanded and amplified when you get the Holy Spirit. And so what happens is you get the Holy Spirit and, and you get saved. When you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, you start living or you keep living like you were living back here under a performance-based system. And what happens when you're over here doing that? You're miserable. You, you can't handle it. It's terrible. It doesn't work. And he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Well, I'm interested in that. He says, who walk not after the flesh. There's your first key. <laughs> and he says, but after the Spirit. So now we want to learn how to do that. Well, keep reading. For the law of the Spirit of Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death says this, where, where sin is, death follows. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is this. Where the spirit is, there's life. And when God gives you his Holy Spirit, and God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit dwell in you, you've got eternal life right then and there. You don't have religion anymore, man. There's no more religion. There's no more of this stuff. You've got eternal life. And that eternal life will allow you to live the life that God wants you to live because he's going to teach you that you're dead and he's going to live his life through you. So where did you die? So I'm still walking around. 
Yeah, physically, but you're dying very slowly, physically. But you, yourself, the part of you you don't even like, you know, the, the soulish man of you, the person that you think, why did I do that? And you hadn't done anything yet. You just thought something. Why am I thinking that way? Because you've got a sin nature in you. And when God the Father and God the Holy Spirit and, 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 God, and the Lord Jesus Christ dwell in you, now you've got two natures in you, and there's a conflict. Galatians 5 explains that. The, lust, the, the, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These two are contrary one to the other, and you cannot do the things that you would. Well, over here you begin to learn about the doctrines of grace, and Paul teaches you all these things from Romans to Philemon, and you begin to trust them and believe them, and you begin to see what's going on, and now, verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Whoopee, now we're getting somewhere. Look at verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and force him condemn sin in the flesh. Did he ever sin? In word, thought, or deed? He did not. Which one of you convinceth me of sin, he says. He never sinned. He went all the way to the cross and died without any sin. Just like he got water baptized without being sinful. Why does he do these things? Because he's the only sacrifice that God will accept for your sin. And that payment must be made by the Lord Jesus Christ. There isn't any other payment. Now, notice what he says. He condemned sin in the flesh and he kept the law. He never sinned in word, thought, or deed. As a man, he's the God man. But in verse 4, he says, now notice verse 4. This is a beautiful passage. This is one of the most beautiful passages in, in the entire book of Romans. I believe it's beautiful. He says, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Well, how are we going to do that? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. There, there again, we're, we're still asking, how do we do this? Look at verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the what? Flesh. It's what you think about. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, and neither indeed can it be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So you learn that walking in the flesh produces sin. But look at verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of God, he is none of his. If you look at that verse, all it's telling you in that verse is that ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, because you've got the Holy Spirit in you. So now you have to either believe it or not believe it. Do you believe that you have the capability of not sinning? Look over at chapter 6. He says... <clears throat> For sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? The answer is a dispensational one. Look at the last part of the verse. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. When you get out from underneath this law program, this performance-based program, and get over here, and you begin to believe that God's message to you is grace and peace, and that's what comes from believing the grace of God is the peace of God. When you begin to understand these things and trust them and believe them and believe that you are in God's family, that you're a child of God, that you've got everything that you've ever needed, and you've already got it up front, you don't have to work for it anymore like you were doing under the law, what happens is you begin to just, what? Relax. And let God work through you, and he does that through the doctrines of grace. That's what true godliness will produce. The law never produced that ever, and it'll never produce it over here because it's going to be done away over here. See, this testament over here was made old here. And now the new one that hadn't been it hasn't been completely instituted yet. It will be over here when he comes back. He's going to make it so that they have the law written in their hearts in such a way that they can walk in those statutes. Well, that's what he's given to us already. Look over at Romans chapter 5. Look at verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, that's the grace of God, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. That means we're not going through the tribulation. We're not going to be under the wrath of God. And he says, for if we, or excuse me, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. And if he did this for us while we were his enemies, what is he going to do to us as his children? He says, much more. I love that. He says, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. You know what atonement means? It means at one mint. We're at one. You are one in Christ Jesus. In other words, you and I here in this room, we're one in Christ. But we're also one with him. He's the head. Is the body and the head one usually? If you're alive, it is. That's how they used to separate you, okay? If they want to separate you from your body, they just cut your head off, okay? So the head, the Lord Jesus Christ, now has millions and millions and millions and millions of surrogate people on this earth that he's living through individually. You are the body of Christ, members in particular. And you have a message that's so important that it's the most important information that anybody that you ever speak to will ever hear. You're in possession of it. You hold in your hands and in your hearts with the word of God and the word of God in you, you hold in your hand the message of heaven itself and you are an ambassador to deliver that message. That's your job. That is your goal. That's why you need to learn the three critical issues. These critical issues are important. God's mandate for us to learn the gospel is easily done through learning these three critical issues. Man's problem, sin, death, and judgment. God's solution to that problem is Calvary and nothing else. It is the cross of Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the gospel of Romans 3, 21 to 31. It's, the, the gospel occurs in 10 verses, I told you. This is the gospel summarized, not in 10 verses, or taught in 10 verses, but summarized in five words. Here it is. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. The Corinthians were carnal. They were babes. They were very, very sinful in their activities. They had a lot of trouble at Corinth. Read 1 Corinthians all the way through and you'll see that. And you see that they had a standing in the gospel. If you go back to chapter 1, you'll notice that they had believed the gospel. Notice uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 2, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now, he addresses two groups of people there. They're all in the same group, but he identifies them as two different groups. Notice what he says, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, group number one. And he says what? To them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Now, they weren't all that way. Because some of them didn't understand their sanctification and that they were, they were set aside for an intended purpose. That's what sanctification is. It's like a vessel. And when you have a vessel that you use and it's set aside for an intended specific purpose, you generally use it for that purpose. You don't take one of your, your best wine goblets out into the driveway and drain your oil into it from the car. You don't do that. You use that for what you drink out of. You see, and, and there are certain vessels that you use that are specifically designed and so forth. And God says, look, you're a chosen vessel unto me. You're to be a vessel of honor, not dishonor. So you need to live in your life upon who you actually are. And you're sanctified by God. You're set apart with an intended purpose. And so he says, now live it. Now, he would never tell you to do something that's impossible for you to do. So when somebody says, I can't live the Christian life, it's impossible. Yes, they're right. It is impossible to live the Christian life. But you can let him live it through you, and he will. Just like he took a hold of people back here and did some amazing things back here when he spoke through them, and he did some amazing things through them, like 
killing a bear, grabbing a bear and killing it with his own hands like David did, or grabbing the lion by the beard and killing it, okay? As you see the things that David did finally culminates into one of the greatest things that he ever did that he's known for, he killed Goliath with one rock. You think that little boy did that all by himself? That was God working through him. And so he, no wonder he begs about those things and says, I'm sorry, I did what I did, you know, because he did something pretty bad later on in his life. And God reveals to him something that we already learn over here. We've learned it now. He learned it back here. Romans chapter 4, David teaches you, when Paul quotes the verses, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Wow, under the law, he learned something that God loved him and, and, and had saved him and had justified him even under the, in the midst of being under that law, but he did it by grace. And when it came time for David to access that grace, what did God do? He let him have some of it. And Nathan tells him, uh, when he talks to him about the sin of Bathsheba, he says, thou shalt not surely die, God hath put away your sin. Wait a minute, God's putting away your sin without the animal sacrifice? Yeah, wow. Because you know the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin, and David was under that system. So he begins to write the Psalms, all these Psalms, he begins to write about it, and it's so wonderful, Paul quotes it over here. Of course, it's quoted by the Holy Spirit. We have something today that's so special that it is such a great message, it is such a privilege to deliver it, that you can't spend your life hiding from it, you got to go out and master these three critical issues and teach people that man's problem is sin, death, and judgment. Teach them that the only solution is that Christ died for their sins and that our response to that is to believe it strictly by faith without anything else. Nothing. That's important. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15 again. And as Paul goes through here, he says... Verse 3, he says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. There's the five words I was talking about. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and was buried and that was rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. This little boy wrote uh, in the crunch question, I give these out at camp. And by the way, there's a stack of them there by Todd. You need to take some of these with you this week. And take these and just put them on somebody's desk. Put them in somebody's hand and say, would you, would you mind filling this out? Let's see what happens. All they can say is no. Which is really not that much of a deal, is it? You can always do it. This boy said, the question is this. If you died today and stood before God and he asked you, why should I let you live with me in heaven, what would, you, what would your answer be? This young man at camp said, I would say because, uh, Lord, I trust that Christ, your son, died on the cross for my sins and rose again the third day. That's pretty good so far, right? Then he adds this, and I have tried with most effort to be a follower of Christ. Well, that's a good thing, but I'm going to tell you, you try to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to fall yourself into the ditch because you'll never be as perfect as he is unless you recognize at first that you're righteous in Christ and you're going to have to get out of the way, okay? You can't do these things. When Adam and Eve sinned, what did they try to do? They didn't get out of the way. They were hiding, but they were trying to fix the problem themselves, weren't they? And God comes up, he says, no, you can't do that. And he comes and puts the, the, the animal skins on them. The, 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 the skin of the innocent animal, the shed blood of an innocent animal, the skin, he covers them, and he says, you, you can't do that. Those fig leaves are going to dry up. You're going to be right back where you were. <laughs> you know, you can't do it. You can't fix the problem. It's already been fixed. But people don't know it because they want to negate this, and they want to hang out over here with Moses and not deal with this. They don't understand this, okay? They'll wear it around their neck. They'll put it on their steeples. They'll put it everywhere, but they don't know what it means. The cross, it's the preaching of the cross that gets people saved. Look at, back at Romans chapter 1, and we've got to stop. Romans chapter 1. Master those three critical issues. Learn those, take it the sheets there, and learn those because sin earns a particular thing. 
and you see the, the, the statement, what is sin or what sin is, and then what sin earns, all right? And uh, it, it doesn't earn you anything good, I can tell you that. Uh, the wages of sin is death, and we've all earned our wages. Now turn back to uh, Romans chapter 1, and you can see in Romans 1 that you don't want to be in the way when you're giving the gospel either. You want to get out of the way in that, because it is the power of God. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel of Christ, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, in the gospel of Christ, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, we told you before in the beginning of this, when you start reading about the faith of Christ... You have to associate that with what he did by going to the cross. He did that by faith. Matter of fact, he did everything he did by faith. And then, turn over to Romans 3. Then you learn about our faith in what he did. So first you have his faith to do it and be faithful and go there and accomplish something that we could put our faith in. And then when we get the gospel preached to us, we put our faith in that and that becomes what say That's the thing that saves us. It's faith in his blood. It's not in your blood. Your, blood's, your blood is, and rightly so, it's considered a toxic substance today. It is a toxic substance as far as God's concerned too. Your blood will never pay for the sins of the world. It will never even pay for one of your own sins because it contains in it Adam's blood. Okay? So by one man's sin entered into the world, you're one of those people. Now notice what Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 21. He's already concluded... After 64 verses of condemnation from 118 to 320, he concludes in verses 19 and 20, he, he draws the, the curtain closed on this particular scene, and he says, Now we know, in verse 19, whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. That's what the law says, guilty, guilty, guilty. Verse 20, therefore, here's the conclusion. By the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Why? Because for by the law is the knowledge of sin. It's not the forgiveness of sin or the payment for sin. That comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Adam is the entrance of sin. Moses is the knowledge of sin. And with Jesus Christ, there's the forgiveness and payment for sin. And that payment is the only payment that God will accept. The only response that God will accept from a human being is what? Faith. No works. Nothing. You're, you're, you're in a position of complete and utter depravity. You have no possible way to ever meet the righteous standard of God. If Adam being sinless wouldn't meet it, how do you expect to meet it being sinful? And even if you could be sinless for five minutes, what are you going to do about your whole life previous to that? Who's going to deal with those sins? The answer is Romans 3.21. The transitional change, the big pivot in the book of Romans is Romans 3.21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Well, let's see it. I'm interested. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, it has a history and he says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, notice, of Jesus Christ, and it is unto all and upon all them that what? There's your faith in Christ, in all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There were, that's where you begin, verse 23, 24, and 25. You get those three critical issues. Look at verse 25. He says, or verse 24, excuse me, being justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth. Notice, not man, not you, but God. But God, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. That propitiation is an all-sufficient, all-satisfying sacrifice that God himself, along with his Son, the Holy Spirit, and himself, God the Father, that they promised before the foundation of the world. Our message predates anything that's happening from Genesis on forward. It is revealed here, yes. Do you know what that program does right there? That finishes the Bible. 
What did he say when he was on the cross? Turn to uh, Colossians. What did the Lord say when he was on the cross? He says, it is finished. And he meant it. Now, Paul says it's finished. What's he talking about? He's talking about the word of God. And he says, I finished it. What I, what I put in here, even though it doesn't run chronologically the way we want it to, well, why would you want it on the end? This is an interruption of something that did not work, is what it is. So, yeah, when it works, it'll finally work out exactly as that is planned. That's a 7,000-year program, by the way, from Adam till right at the end of this. This is the last 1,000 years of it. That's one week. That kingdom being the picture of the Sabbath, or the Sabbath being the picture of that kingdom, I should say, that's a 7,000-year program. That 7,000 years that goes from Adam till here includes us right here. Nobody knew about it except God. And God says here in Colossians 1.25, he says, through Paul, by inspiration, he says that it was given unto me to complete the word of God, to fulfill it. Look at this. He says, verse 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. That's what Paul's ministry was doing. He was just being afflicted for preaching what Christ had done in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. There it is. It's just like Ephesians 3.3, 3, or verse 1. It's the same thing. He says to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. To God who would, what? would make known to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. How do you want to present your family and your friends, your associates, your, your, your neighbors? How do you want to present those people at the presentation, when you're presented before the Lord, how do you want to present them up here? Do you want to, pre do you want to present a bunch of people that, that knew nothing about the work of the ministry and did nothing in the work of the ministry? Or do you want to produce a group of people that learned this, understood it, learned their identity in relation to who Israel was, preached their message in their day, and helped produce and grow the body of Christ? That's the whole purpose, presenting them perfect, mature in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. This whole program is the only program on this chart right here so far in 6,000 years of human history that there's ever been any evangelism going on. Okay? Now, there was some going on here for a three and a half year period, starting with John the Baptist roughly, and then after the cross, all the way up until Saul gets saved. But that's a very, very small amount compared to what's been going on for 1,970 years. Now there's a bigger one coming. That's Matthew 28, 19, and 20, Mark 16. That's the, that's the so-called Great Commission. That's going to be fulfilled over here when Israel finally gets a chance to take the message of the cross and their Savior and the King of Israel out to the nations of the world, and they'll believe it at that time. The Bible says that in him shall the Gentiles trust, and they will. But today, there is no difference. Jew and Gentile are not two statuses before God. There's no difference. There is no status now for Israel, and there is no status for the Gentile uh, other than, than the status that's actually been elevated because we got, we got cast down back here, and we've been down here the whole time, and now Israel has fallen, and they're down here with us. We're all in the same boat, aren't we? but what a boat it is, because that boat has complete access through Paul to the message of grace. You live in a very interesting time, and you live in a time in which the gospel of grace is clearly able to be preached to everyone. Unfortunately, when you turn on the televisions, or you go to the bookstore and you try to find information about this, what happens? They want to teach you about the other program. That's confusing. And it's been confusing. That's why Christendom is so fragmented and, and, and it's, it's just one big group of isms and schisms. And most of the people 
that, that I have come in contact with in 30 years of my ministry, they don't know the gospel of grace of God at all. They have no clue what's going on. They'll tell you right just quick that I, I, I believe in the Sermon on the Mount. Really? The Sermon on the Mount is going to get you saved? That, that came before the cross. There is no message back here before the cross that can save you by the cross. It didn't exist. And even after the cross, they didn't get it until Paul got it right over here. So what do we have? We have a mandate to preach the cross. That's what we have. And if you go out and explain it in this manner right here, what will happen is you can systematically create a way in your mind to where you can go right down the thing, easy as one, two, three, and give them the gospel. Now you can, as I said here in the program, you can put your own personality in this, your new one, Take your old one and chuck it, because it's dead. They don't want to hear about that. You don't want to be offensive when you go out and give the gospel. But what you want to do is to be able to be prepared. Our message demands preparation and training. And as any group of soldiers, especially in this army, uh, it's a constant ongoing thing, that you must learn these things in order to be effective in what you do. Okay? The gospel of grace of God is a great privilege to give out. And uh, in this room, right here, and for 25 years, we've been preaching this to people, and they've been getting saved left and right. Okay, it's been great. I told my wife today, we've got one, we got one mother with three. She's got a new one, Kristen. We got two mothers with one new one each. They're completely novice in this whole thing, right? Jamie's learning, and so is Kathy. And then we've got we've got one who's had her second one, and she's a novice also because they're like that close together. Okay. <laughs> And uh, she brought, uh, Raquel brought uh, little Alex in. I saw him this week, this past week. And uh, she had been out on her first uh, little trip out since she got home from the hospital. She went to the doctor, and she brought him by for me to see him. And I'm going to tell you something. He's a cutie. He's got blonde hair, and he's as cute as he can be. He's probably going to be here today, maybe. I don't know. But I can tell you this. Four newborns in this assembly at one time. That's a mission right there. Get those kids saved. And they're running around all over the place around here. Uh, and it's important that we think that way about the gospel, isn't it? That young people can get saved, and it gives them an opportunity to not have to live a life of sin and debauchery that they can actually learn how to apply the doctrines of grace in their life when they're young. The greatest advantage of raising children is to get the Holy Spirit in them as early as possible, okay? That's very important. And that happens the minute you get saved, okay? Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you today for your word.